Now let's pray real quick. Dear Heavenly Father, we just uh, thank you for being with us, Lord, and uh, um, standing with us during difficult times. And we have the, the knowledge that you are there. Sometimes it's harder to see it, but we know it's there. We know you're there with us. And uh, we just ask that you be with us here today as we take in your word and just really digest it for our benefit so that we can be more fruitful servants for you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Wow. So anybody in here overwhelmed today? <laughs> anybody? I'm not. No, I'm just kidding. I, I'm, I'm kind of overwhelmed a little bit. Um, I'll tell you a, a little story. I mean, I could use something more current about being overwhelmed, but I'm going to use something a little older. So um, all you know that my daughter, Aubrey, was born premature. And leading up to that point, Krista was in, on bed rest for 12 weeks before the birth. And that was a very overwhelming period of time. And there was a point when we were going into the delivery, because um, it had to do a C-section, but um, they told us, they told us, realistically, we're looking at a couple of hours with Aubrey. That's what we're looking, looking at. And that's what they told us when we were going into the operation to retrieve her from the womb. And I remember sitting in the, this waiting, waiting room. Well, it was like an actual room. And I was just overwhelmed. It was really eerie, because that room was like a closed door. And it was by myself and darkness a little bit. It was kind of weird. But I was just really overwhelmed with the situation going on. And I remember praying to God. I am asking him to relieve the, the pressure, the, the, the strain on this situation, and that be grateful for, allow me to be grateful for any time I had with my daughter. And, and something changed while I was waiting in that room. And I felt just an overwhelming feeling in me of peace about Aubrey. And lo and behold, she started kindergarten this week, right? <laughs> and that's a whole other overwhelming situation. So... So I have been overwhelmed this whole week while she's going to kindergarten because it's all day. She's gone all day. I was like, sitting there at lunch, I'm like, Aubrey should be here eating lunch with me, but she's not. So we're going to talk about going from overwhelmed to being overflowing and what that means. But first, we've got to start off with Psalms 20, Psalm 23. So if you can read with me out loud. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not be in want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in a path of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me, in the presence of my enemies, you anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. All right. Well, last week, um, we talked about uh, the table, the banquet table. And this week, we're, we are going to be talking about in, in verse 5, about my cup overflows. But first, I forgot something. God is good. All the time. All the time. God is All right, good. good. All right, now, now we can get started. Okay. Uh, so today we're looking at, looking at my cup overflows. Um, and I don't know if you know this, but Time Magazine has said that we live in an age of FOMO. Anybody know what FOMO is? F-O-M-O. -O. Um, it's the fear of missing out. Anybody here fearing missing out of anything right now? No. 70%, they said, no, this is the stat they gave. Now, I know sometimes they make things up, but we'll, we'll go with it. 70% of millennials, because they are on social media so much, they struggle, they say they struggle with FOMO. And in the desire to keep up with everybody, people have overbooked their calendars, overspent their money, overdrawn their credit, overloaded their emotions, overworked their bodies, and overvalued the approval of other people. 
as a result, people feel overstressed, overanxious, and overwhelmed. Now, why do people do this? Why do we overkill? It's the fear of missing out. People, they, they don't want to feel inferior or inadequate or unloved or left out of something big happening. So today we're going to be looking at the subject of moving from being overwhelmed to overflowing. I want to begin by explaining two fundamental, fundamentally different approaches to life. And you can approach life either way. You can approach life with a shortage mindset, or you can approach life with a surplus mindset. And they result in two very different outcomes. There's a big, big difference in those two. A shortage mindset means I will never have enough. I will never have enough, and I never will. Never having enough will leave you feeling overwhelmed. I don't have enough time. I'm overwhelmed. I don't have enough money. I'm overwhelmed. I don't have enough energy. I'm overwhelmed. I don't have enough contacts. I'm overwhelmed. I don't have enough opportunities or knowledge or education or whatever you can come up with that you don't have enough of. It's going to leave you overwhelmed. It's that feeling that you're always a day late and a dollar short. <laughs> a good example is in the Bible, uh, is about a, a famine in Israel. And um, Elijah, Elijah, sorry, I verify. Elijah and his servant, Gehazi, had a discussion about this. And it's in 2 Kings 4, 42 through 44. And it says, a man brought Elijah, well, okay, it is Elisha. That's what I was thinking. Um, a man brought Elisha, the prophet, some loaves of bread. Now remember, this is a famine going on right now in Israel. Elijah says, give it to the people so they could eat. Elijah's servant said, there's not enough here for a hundred people. <laughs> not enough. Okay, see, not enough is a shortage mindset. It's a shortage mentality. Just give it to them, Elijah said. The Lord has promised that there will be more than enough. Okay, now that is the surplus mindset. Enough. So the servant gave the bread to the people. Well, you know, and sure enough, it says, they ate until full and still had some left over, just as, as God had promised. So your shortage lifestyle, I'm never going to have enough. Now, the focus, if you want to write this down, is the result of a shortage mindset is I focus on my limited resources. It's not going to be on your, it's not going to be a spot for it, but you just write that down. My limited resources. Anybody here have limited resources? Well, see, that's a limited mindset. Come on, guys. I'm just talking about this. <laughs> All right. <laughs> that's true, though. We have limited resources. Um, I look at all things that I'm lacking. I don't have enough money. I don't have enough time. I don't have enough energy. The result of a shortage mindset is an overwhelmed life. I just don't feel, I just feel so overwhelmed by everything that's going on in my life. I am just always behind. I'm just always in competition with the others. When you have a shortage lifestyle, you think that life is like a, a pie. If someone takes a bigger piece of the pie, it leaves a smaller piece for you. So there's that limited number of resources to go around. And if they get more, you get less, which causes resentment. And you're going to get worried that what if more people take more of the pie? Or you're going to get anxious because there's, so much, there's only so much pie to go around. What if you're left with no pie? That's the shortage mentality. It leads to envy, to jealousy, resentment, worry, and insecurity in your life. If you have any of those in your life, you have a shortage mentality. But, what's the other way? The other side is a surplus mindset. 
God has more than I'll ever need. God will never run out of what you need. God doesn't give us one pie. God is a pie factory. You can have as much pie as he gives you. There will always be more pies because God will keep creating them for you. In the Bible, we have words like abundance and plentiful and abounding and bountiful. God has more than enough to meet your needs and to everybody else in this world. At the same time, he doesn't just go one at a time. At the same time, he can meet everyone's need. Philippians 4.19 says, And my God will meet all your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. Let me give you an example. Have you ever worried that the person breathing next to you was stealing your air? <laughs> yeah. Of course. <laughs> of course not. Why? Because God created more than enough air for us to breathe. And everyone else has all they can have, too. God has more than enough to meet all your needs and everyone else's needs at the same time. I say these multiple times just so you remember it, just by the way. Focus on God's limitless resources, not your limited resources. See, that changes everything. It's a game changer. God's unlimited. He's got plenty. And it results in an overflowing life. It's a life that David refers to in Psalm 23, 5b. You will fill my cup to overflows. The International Children's Bible, ICB, says, you give me more than I can hold. I like the child's version. It's, really, it's nice. Make, it kind of makes it easier for me to read. I don't want to hear it. <laughs> so what is in your cup? What is in my cup? What is it? What is that? What's the metaphor that is being drawn here? So you want to write this down because you want to remember this too. My cup, or your cup, is my life. When David says that his cup runs over, he's saying, my life is overflowing. Jesus talked about this in John. John 7, 37 through 38. On the last and greatest day of the festival, Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, Let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. Okay, so now, let me put this in context. There's, there's probably about 50,000 people, roughly, on the last day of the festival outside the temple. That's 50,000 people. That, I mean, there's a lot of drama and chaos. People talking, lots of conversations. But Jesus stands up in front of them all and shouts to the people. And what is he talking about? He's talking about the same thing David talked about. My cup runs over. He's telling them how to have an overflowing life. He says, whoever believes in me. In the Greek text, the word is, no, I had to look this up, by the way. I'm taking my dad's notes from this, and I'm like, I don't know how to pronounce that. So I had to research how to pronounce it. And it is... Pistuto. No, sorry. Pistuo. Yeah, that's how it says. I wrote it out here. It actually means more than just having head knowledge. It's like, I believe Jesus is the Son of God. It means to trust in the knowledge. It means to cling to. It means to rely on and to depend on. He is saying, if you really, really, really depend on me, your life is going to overflow. Amen. Okay, well, but what is the overflowing life? We talk about this, right? Well, you can write this down too, if you want. An overflowing life is to be filled beyond capacity with an endless supply of God's goodness. This metaphor that the cup is your life, my cup overflows. The Bible uses this all through scripture and it talks about having a cup of joy, having a cup of blessing, God's blessing, have a cup of hope, having a cup of peace, having a cup of salvation. He said, I want your life to overflow with you and, your, and hope and blessing and salvation. 
Why? Because God is good. Oh. Ah, nice. In Isaiah 48, 17 through 18, it says, This is what the Lord says, Your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. I am the Lord your God, who teaches you what is best for you, who directs you in the way you should go. If only you had paid attention to my commands, your peace would have been like a river, your well-being like the waves of the sea. Did you know that God wants you to succeed in an overflowing way in your life? God wants your life to overflow with peace and well-being. Well, he says there, if you want to have, if you would have just observed the commands I gave you, if you were obedient, if you are obedient to God and what he commands, peace like a river will flow from you. Well-being like waves of the sea. It sounds great, doesn't it? And there's only one thing you have to do. Obey God. Be obedient to God and his commands. The reality is that anytime God says, do it this way, and I go, well, I think I know better, and I think I know what will make me happy more than God does, you're saying you don't trust God. And when we think about how much... Uh, how we know how to make ourselves happy by doing things different than what God says, it, it, it's all kind of a, it causes all kinds of problems in our lives. You get overstressed, overstrained, overburdened, over anxious, overwhelmed, because we are doing it our way. He says in John 10, 10, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that you may have life and have it to the full. How can we experience an overflowing life? Well, there's four habits, because I'm not going to leave you in the dark. There's four habits that will help you. I'm just, you know, I could just end it now and just leave you hanging, you know. Just, how will I experience an overwhelming life? But okay, I'll give it to you. Stay connected to Jesus every day. This is important. Okay, you guys know me, I like coffee, right? If, I, if my coffee maker is not plugged into the, the power, can I make coffee? That would not be good. I need my coffee. <laughs> so we gotta stay connected to the power of our lives every day. Now, how to do this, it's, it sounds new age, but meditation. And it's not the mindless humming that people do. It's focusing on and paying attention to God's word and his promises and knowing what his promises are and his commands to fulfill those promises so that you can have those promises fulfilled in your life. <coughs> Does everyone here know how to worry? Well, then you need to know how to meditate. You know, you know how to meditate then because you think about things so much that you worry. So you change what you think about the things that God has for you that are good and it helps you not worry. In John 15, 5, it says, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Okay, so the big thing I caught in the scripture that I don't think I've ever really caught about caught before, is if you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Sounds good, right? The second part, though, apart from me, you can do a small thing. No, uh, a little bit. No, it says nothing. You can do nothing. It's not partial. It's not, you know, hey, I can get a little bit done. You can do nothing without Christ. Without staying connected to Christ, you will never have enough. How do you stay connected? A daily feast in the Word of God. A time to just enjoy the feast. Who here likes food? Everyone has like a favorite dish, right? The Bible is your favorite dish. 
Read it like it is. Every day. In John 15, 7 through 11, it says, If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so, I, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. I don't know about you, that sounds a lot like overflowing joy in our lives that he's talking about. It's amazing promise. Stay connected so you can have overflowing joy in your life. Amen. Number two, second habit that you need to work on, I need to work on. Stop complaining and start being grateful. Gratitude is a healthy emotion. The key to overflowing life is being grateful to God for what he's given us. There's an article I was reading part of for this um, and it said griping is one of the unhealthiest emotions and it causes more damage in you than almost any other emotion. And gratitude has the same level of effect on you as being in love. That, that it releases the same type of chemicals in your brain being grateful for something. Philippians 2, 14 says, do everything without grumbling or arguing. What are you complaining about today? And when you complain about something, does it make you feel better? Usually not. What can help with that? Well, in Colossians 2, 7, it says, overflowing with thankfulness. So here we are, overflowing with joy. By staying connected to Jesus. Overflowing with thankfulness by being grateful. If you're grateful to God, you'll be thankful. And then everything he gives you, you're thankful for. So you can be thankful to everything around you. And it just starts spreading like a virus. Being thankful. What, what would happen if this whole world became thankful? <coughs> Amazing. Maybe we'd all get along a little better, huh? First Thessalonians 5, 18 says, Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. I gotta say, this is a very hard scripture. We are human, and it's hard for me to give thanks in all circumstances. Um, this weekend has been really challenging. And the overflowing, overwhelmed, all that stuff. It was working out pretty good in my brain for this message. It's kind of funny that God have us teaching this message. But I'm going to go back just to Wednesday. And at uh, youth group, we talked about joy. Having joy at all times. Even in the dark times, you can have joy. It's about where you put your mind. And it says... Give thanks in all circumstances. It's, it's the same thing. Your, your thankfulness and joy, it all comes from God. And if we depend on God, it doesn't matter the situation you're in. You'll be overflowing with it. So how, how do you do that? You, you start your day being gracious to God. Start your day in prayer saying, thank you, Lord, for everything. It's all his. And for others. And you'll overflow for the rest of the day as you keep going and keep praying and staying in the word. Make a list of things that you're grateful for. You might have to take a week off from work, just so you know, to make that list. Send an email, this is, this is interesting, send an email of gratitude every day to someone. Find someone in your life every day to send a, gra a gracious note to. And that will help. That will help. All right, so you're, the, third, the third thing to do is stop comparing and start being content. Yeah, 
That's right. The word doesn't look right for me. But stop comparing and start being content. Contented? Contented? Yeah, okay. In second, uh, let's see here. I can look up something. Second Corinthians 10, 12 says, we do not dare to classify or compare ourselves with some who commend themselves. When they measure themselves by themselves and compare themselves with themselves, they are not wise. If you're not wise, what are you? A fool. A fool. Yeah, yeah. So it causes two problems if you're comparing to somebody else, keeping up with the Joneses next door. Pride and discouragement. Right now, we live in a time where it's never been easier to compare yourself to other people. I like all the kindergarten and the first day of school pictures and stuff, but have you, have, did you notice it's kind of comparing? And everyone had to run up each other. There's always these new things, people having chalk on the ground and stuff. And it just, it's crazy that people, the social media aspect of our world today just creates a comparison world where we're just kind of trying to compare to what everyone else is doing. And, and you're like, oh, I need that, or I want that. They have that, I want that, that looks nice. And it's so fast. And in some regards, it gets to you faster than you can get into the Word. Satan has found a way to invade our brains faster than what we can do, deal with. It's too easy to get caught up in presenting your perfect life to the rest of the world than being real with those around you. In Colossians 4, 7, or 1 Corinthians 4, 7, it says, for who, is that right? Yeah, yeah. Okay, I gotta be honest, there's some shorthand on here I'm still learning, and so, my, it's my dad's notes, so. For who makes you different from anyone else? What do you have that you did not receive? If you did not receive it, why do you boast as though you did not? Would you like to be, to be healthier in your life? Live longer? <coughs> Proverbs 14.30 says, A heart at peace gives life to the body, but envy rots the bones. Cle Ecclesiastes 4.6 says, Better one handful with tranquility than two handfuls with toil and chasing after the wind. I always like that one. Chasing after the wind. Anybody here chase the wind? <laughs> That's very hard to do, Right? Paul said he learned to be content. The richest person in the world is not the one with the most things, but the one that's mostly, that mo is most contented with their life. The four habits for overflowing life, daily meditation, daily gratitude, daily contentment, and the fourth one is stop being stingy and start being generous. Stinginess is evidence of a shortage mindset. God wired the universe this way. More generous you are, the more given will overflow. If you're stingy, you're worried that you're going to lose what you have. It's not going to be enough. If you're generous, you know you have more than enough. In 2 Corinthians 9, 6 through 8, it says, Remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion. For God loves a cheerful, cheerful giver. And God is able to bless you abundantly, so that in all things, at all times, Having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. Amen. When God's people... Ever, ever wonder why you don't have enough? Back with Daniel, God's people were finally allowed to return. 
and we talked about this earlier. Charles talked about this. They were returned to Jerusalem, and they started building up the city again. But they didn't build the temple up. Instead, the people spent all their time and money on themselves to live in nice houses. So they never really had enough. In the book of Haggai, it's, it speaks to this. It says in uh, 1, 6 through 9, it says, You have planted much, but harvested little. You eat, but never have enough. You drink, but never have your fill. You put on clothes, but are not warm. You earn wages, only to put them in a purse with holes in it. This is what the Lord Almighty says. Give careful thought to your ways. Go up into the mountains and bring down timber and build my house, so that I may take pleasure in it and be honored, says the Lord. You expected much, but see, it turned out to be little. What you brought home, I blew away. Why, declares the Lord Almighty, because of my house, which remains in a ruin, while each of you is busy with your own house. Could this be why you don't have enough? Could this be why you don't have enough in your life? Because you're worried about your house instead of God's house. Remember the I dare you verse in Malachi 3.10? Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be room enough to store it. Oh, that goes to the overflowing thing again, right? It's amazing how often that's one of the promises. Do you trust Jesus? Yes. yes. How much? All the time. Luke 6, 38 says, Give and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and run over, will be poured into your lap. For with the, me the measure you use, it will be measured to you. It all boils down to how much you trust Jesus. Matthew 9, 29 says, According to your faith, let it be done to you. I'm going to end with a challenge. And as we sing, we're going to be singing Forever Rain here. How do you want to live? What do you need more of? Time? Money? Knowledge, energy, more opportunities in life. I challenge you to commit to these four daily habits. I will connect with Jesus every day through prayer and meditation on his word. I will stop complaining and start being more grateful every day for what is given to me. I will stop comparing and start being connected every day. I'm sorry, start being contented every day. I will stop being stingy and start being generous every day. Do you want to live an overflowing life? Yes. Every day? Amen. Yes. All right, let's stand and sing. Dear Holy Father, we just uh, come to you today. Um, and we just ask that you just reign in our lives, Lord. Just overflow us. No matter what this world brings against us, Lord, you are our king. And you are our protector and our shepherd. And you protect us, Lord. And we know that your arms reach around us and protect us, Lord. Please let us leave here and live overflowed lives with your spirit mm -hmm. so that those around us can see you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.